So hi, my name is Dr. Deepak Dugar. I am a facial plastic surgeon in Beverly Hills. Uh, my practice is very niche. I only do two things. I do scarless, closed drinoplasty, and I do injectables, and that's it. Uh, so Botox and fillers, and noses, and that's my entire practice. It's very niche, and um, I like it that way. And as you build your practice, you'll figure out and decide, do you like to have a dynamic practice, or do you 15 or 20 or 50 different procedures, or just one or two? And that's just how I build my practice. So I always want to thank my mentors anytime I give a talk anywhere, because without your mentors, you don't really have anything. Um, so Dr. Raj Kanodi, he's my partner and my uh, mentor in Beverly Hills, who I work with, and he's taught me endless amounts about fillers and noses. He's the master, and uh, without him, I would be nowhere. And also want to thank Dr. Jean Louis Sabag in Paris, who's been a close mentor of mine as well, teaching me injectables. He's been at the forefront of this longer than any American even has when things were out in Europe before us, and he's been invaluable to my teaching. Um, so. What I always tell people when they're starting out, uh, once you get to busy practice and you have 60 to 100 injection patients a week, you don't need to listen to anyone, okay? Uh, just do your thing and you figure it out. But until then, when you're still building, it's really iconic and helpful to study faces. And I think study faces in fashion magazines. Study the ones that really uh, attract you because you need to figure out your aesthetic eye before you can create something aesthetically pleasing for somebody. Patients can come in and ask for something, but if you don't know in the deep down in your head what beauty looks like, how do you create it? So I recommend studying faces, and we're gonna go through a lot of this. My talk is gonna be more <coughs> theory, so it's a little bit more chill. Uh, you don't have to take notes, just think about everything. Um, and what you have to decide from the beginning, once you start to get busy, you, you, you won't be able to switch. So you have to decide, are you gonna be an artist, sorry, or an artist or a craftsman, okay? And the difference is the craftsman versus the artist, the only difference is the artist is the one making the design. Are you designing or are you telling your patients that hey, whatever you want, I'll do for you? Both are correct, both work. One of them will lead to a little bit more headache, I think, but both of them are correct. Some patients will come in and demand, I want four cc's in my lips. Some patients will come in and demand, I want more filler in my cheek, even though you don't think they do. Are you gonna just do it as a craftsman, which is totally fine, You're, it's an ethical thing to do, or do you make decisions for your patients? you tell them, no, I don't agree, next, and get them in and out and make the decisions for them. If you're making the decisions and you're the artist, you'll have more satisfaction long-term as you build your practice, and you'll be able to build a much bigger and busier practice, because you'll be able to herd them in and out much faster. We sometimes see 60 to 100 injection patients a week in our practice. We don't have time to really take every single one of their preferences into account. It's just not possible. So what we do is create more or less of a template of beauty that we artistically see, and they fall within that parameter if they want to continue to see us. Um, always analyze the face really carefully. Make sure they're upright. Make sure you analyze smiling and non-smiling. Because you have to realize sometimes their issues are dynamic. They may disappear when they smile. It may not be though when they're not smiling. You have to understand those things and understand how to address them. If they have an issue that's only there when they're not smiling, and they smile, then you have to think about that. Putting filler in that area may not be a good idea because what's it gonna look like when they're smiling and vice versa. So always analyze smiling and non-smiling. And then you have to figure out how you're gonna look at the face. The way I look at the face is upper and lower vectors is how I study the face. Upper vector being the cheek complex from nasal labial to the malar prominence, and the lower vector being the chin to the angle of the mandible. And we'll kind of go over how I look at that. Appreciate the vectors and understand your anatomy. You know we're not gonna go into anatomy today, but it's really important to understand the anatomy. A, because you can document what you did much more carefully. B, you can communicate with your colleagues. You're gonna get in trouble, you're gonna have mistakes, you're gonna have to talk to people about things. If you understand the anatomy, you can communicate much better. And thirdly, most importantly, it keeps you out of trouble. And there's a lot of the issues and a lot of things that you have to be careful with, so I urge you to study the anatomy, understand it. Not everyone has to be a surgeon to understand the anatomy. Anyone can understand the anatomy. You just have to study a little bit. So make sure you do that. And it gives your patients a lot more confidence in you if you can tell them all the anatomical basis for why you're doing something, okay? When you're studying the face, just study people's faces. You know, for the next few minutes, don't worry about what I'm saying as much as just stare at the screen, look at these faces, and pick out what you're noticing, you know? It's about the contours. Look how strong the upper and lower vectors of these faces are. Look how strong the upper and lower vectors. Because that's what you're trying to create. You want to create these upper and lower strong vectors. You want to restore them on patients who are losing the vectors. You want to create them on patients who don't have them. Or you might want to enhance them on someone who has a strong jawline or a strong cheek, but just a little bit more gives that oomph to the face. And so it's about analyzing the painting and enhancing, restoring, or creating if necessary. So the cheek complex, the way I always look at it, is three different parts. And it's really important to understand that because when you're injecting a cheek, it's not always just injecting the apple of the cheek. We see a lot of that uh, post 
housewife chipmunk cheat thing going on, and we all say, oh, who's doing these fillers? And somebody's doing them, lots of us are, even in this room. So this is the kind of the basic stuff you that I made for myself. Laugh lines, middle is the cheek pads, and then laterally is zygomatic prominence. And that's where you really have to study where are they actually having the depletion of volume. If they're not having a depletion of volume in the middle area, then don't inject there. If they're not having any problems with their lateral cheek, don't inject there. But you really have to study in all views, three quarters view and laterally, and understand that strength should be seen in all three dimensions. And you really have to isolate where the problem of concern is. Is it the middle? Is it lateral? Is it the medial cheek? And only inject where you're seeing those depressions. So it's really about the artistic eye that you create in yourself. And for the lower vector, you have to understand the importance of a strong jawline. It restores that youthful prominence when you lose it over time. And then also, it gets that demarcation between the face and the neck. You see a lot of patients who have low, weak jaws. And what it does is it looks like their face is just blending into their neck. And so what you do is you want to recreate that strong angle of the jaw, that strong jawline prominence to give them that youthful contour they may have had 10 years, 20, 30 years ago. So you study the jawline, you study the strong angulation that comes from the mandible. And what you want to look at is when you look at these patients, what you're noticing is how youthful their faces look because of these strong prominences. And every culture is different, of course. This is the Caucasian culture where we appreciate a strong jawline. I just spent a week in Seoul, South Korea, about two months ago, working with different plastic surgeons and oral surgeons, and they have a totally different view on beauty. So you have to understand that. What is your view and what is your patient clientele view on beauty, of course? This would be disgusting to the average uh, South Korean surgeon, um, as it's way too strong for their patient population. But that strong jawline, you really have to study, and I love to study fashion magazines. That's where I study pretty much 90% of my artistic design is looking at fashion magazines, studying the faces, because that implants and kind of sets a seed in my head when I'm looking at a patient of what I want to create. Because if you don't have that intrinsically set inside of you, it's hard to understand exactly what they need to give them that oomph that makes them go home, look in the mirror, and feel great, and want to come back to you again. So with that, uh, angle of the jaw and the mandible, obviously you want to study your anatomy, be very aware of it because it's not a totally harmless place. You do have to worry about a few structures and important things. So again, we're not going to go into anatomy today. This is something that you can all study on your own. But it's more of a philosophy to understand how important anywhere you're injecting the anatomy is the key. Uh, so the loss of the strength, telltale sign of aging. And how it happens, you know, basically over time as you age, you lose a little bit of the subcutaneous fat. And then you also you lose the outer table of the mandible. The mandible has an inner and outer cortex. And what you do is the outer cortex of the mandible gets a little demineralization. You lose that calcium. And over time, it becomes softer. And you see this in anyone in here that's over the age of 50 or 60. If they pick out their photos from when they were in their 20s and 30s, they see they had a stronger jawline. They had a stronger cheeks. And over time, you're losing that. So our job is to restore and replace that lost uh, volume. Uh, so we're doing pretty good on time. So, the whole thing is just study, 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 study these jaw lines, understand the strength, understand where it's coming from, because this is where you're going to fill, and this is what you create. When you're doing jaw line fillers, you look at the jaw in three areas, the chin, from the chin to the angle, and then from the angle to the condyles, and that's the area that you're filling, okay? These three different areas, and we look at them as three separate areas when we're doing fillers on jaw line. Sometimes we don't do all three at one sitting. Sometimes we'll just build up this part, and then, oh, next time come back, we'll do a little bit here. Next time come back, maybe a little on the chin. And so that's where you have to figure out and isolate the problem areas so you can grow and build on them with your patients. Oftentimes, it runs in the family, as you know. Um, jaw lines can be something that's hereditary, and uh, I, I love to study these really iconic, important, beautiful faces because it gives you this sense of what you're trying to create with your own patients. And I really urge you to study that as much as you can. Uh, in general, I use HA for my fillers. I'm not going to go too much into the types of products. We'll talk about <coughs> that in the training sessions. Um, because they're biodegradable, there's little to no reaction. Um, it incorporates into the tissue immediately when it's injected. And reversible, of course, as you all know. But a lot of stars there, because I'm going to talk about just a little bit, uh, a little bit more about that. Because it's not a delete button on a keyboard. That's not how it works. Um, when I'm injecting a significant volume, you know, at least one or two cc's in a deep layer, I always use cannulas just because I feel that it's much safer versus the amount of needle pricks sometimes you have to do. Um, but that being said, I use needles all the time. So it's back and forth, but the restoration of that mid volume loss. And it's important to study this before and after. Look at, you know, a lot of famous celebrities, they don't always have the ideal proportions. So I don't necessarily say study celebrities when I say to study faces, because celebrities don't necessarily have the right proportions. When you look at, you know, James Bond, you see a significant loss of volume to the mid face. He would benefit immensely with some HA. When you look at Iron Man, significant loss of volume in the mid face, and this would benefit greatly 
This happens because of aging, and also as you get older and you're extremely cardioactive, you can lose a lot of that baby fat and lose a lot of that facial volume. It's not just the descent of the fat pads, there's also just a significant sense of uh, loss of volume. If you treat patients who are a little chubbier, you'll notice they have a little bit more volume, and having a little extra weight actually protects your facial structures versus being significantly cardioactive. That being said, no one's gonna go out and gain 15 pounds just to get a little volume in their face. So you have to be realistic about it. And then the lower vector as well. So look at this lady, she has a little bit of a loss of volume in her lower jawline from the chin to the angle of the jaw. And so what we do is restore the volume just by using about one and a half cc's on each side to restore that contour. So she has a smooth contour from chin all the way to the angle of the jaw versus this where you have a little bit of that depression there. Another example on a male, he has kind of a long, straight jaw, and we're able to give him a stronger angle of the jaw by using HAs. So studying the upper vector of the face and the lower vector of the face is how I personally have been able to isolate the problems in my patients' faces and give them quick solutions that I can offer to them immediately. So they gain their confidence in how I view faces. You don't have to use this system, but you can use a system where you can easily identify problems and come up with solutions that make your patients feel comfortable with your choices. So I just, the next few slides, just kind of study and look, ignore what I'm saying, but it's about any ethnic face. You know, you want to look at the upper and lower vectors. This is what you're studying in almost every single face, that upper and lower strength of the vectors, even Asian faces, Caucasian faces, African American faces, that upper and lower vector, that strength is what you're trying to recreate to give that volume look, that sculpted look in the middle with the upper vector strength and lower vector strength. That's what's beautiful. That's what looks iconic to me. And so you have to choose, what is your look? What do you like to create with your patients? Do you like in that, like a classy look with a strong upper vector or not? And this is what you study and you keep deciding and it's just drill in your head, this is what I'm looking to create every day when I go to work. The strong upper and lower vectors, strong upper and lower vectors. So from patient to patient, you just study this. Just look at magazines, tear out the pages on the airplanes. Just sit there and study their faces. What makes them pretty? What is it about this face that makes her pretty? Is it the eyes? Is it the cheeks? Is it the jawline? You have to decide that. Study these. What do these faces have that the patients you're seeing don't have? Why do your patients feel they're not pretty? What is it about this? And you have to figure that out. That's not something I can really teach. But what I'm trying to impart is that the upper and lower vectors <coughs> are extremely important for facial contouring. You see two classically good looking guys, one with very youthful vectors and one with loss of volume. Again, very good looking guy, probably a polo model, extremely good looking, classically great bone structure, and yet still significant loss of volume in the mid cheek. Significant muscularity to a face, very toned, significant loss of volume in the face. So that loss of volume is extremely critical. And then also keep in mind the length and width of a face. A wider face versus a longer face have different needs. You can't just take this short, small face and keep making bigger cheeks and bigger jawline. It'll look terrible. Likewise, with a guy like him, you can't just give him a bunch of chin filler to make his chin longer, even if it is recessed. So the things that you have to keep in. So really quickly, we'll go through just some of what I call my pearls uh, from learning from my own mistakes and from my own uh, <coughs> problems that I've had in my practice. One, hyaluronidase, re reversing HAs is not a delete button. Okay, don't sell your patients on that. Don't let them know, oh, don't worry, if you don't like it, we'll just reverse it. Let them know there's a caveat. That being said, it's a rescue drug. Okay, it's just like Narcan, if any of you uh, do surgeries or anything do surgeries. You don't just give Narcan at the end of every case to reverse the narcotics you gave them. Hyaluronidase is literally a rescue drug because it dissolves natural HA2. It doesn't just dissolve the HA you inject. It dissolves the HA that's naturally in their face and their skin as well. We had a patient who had HA injected in her cheek by another doctor. And so we were trying to help her uh, basically dissolve it. It became a nodule from some resin that was injected. And so we were injecting it over time, it was getting softer, softer. What happened was, ended up with a divot. And the divot's not because the filler went away, it's because we were injecting to the point where her natural HA was going away. So these are things that you understand and learn, and with time, you have patients who come back and say, oh, I hate my lips, can you reverse it? The answer is no, unless it's mandatory, a rescue drug. You don't just reverse things willy-nilly and say, oh, don't worry about it, yeah, let's just inject some HA and be done with it, because there are complications with injecting hyaluronidase. And just keep that in mind, just keep that in the back of your head, do whatever you do, but just keep that in the back of your mind. It's not a delete button on a, on a computer key where everything goes back to normal. Yes, question. Uh, no. Well, um, 
personal preference, I don't use any non-HA products in the face. Uh, it's just a personal preference. Um, and uh, but no, I, I, I have not done that, nor would I potentially do that either. Um, because again, you know, the the concept of shrinking or taking away tissue with HA, it's a rescue drug. It's not something that should be a, uh, a treatment algorithm. I think, generally speaking, there's obviously exceptions to everything. Um, well, that's not right. Okay. So, one two punch. Now, there's just gonna be a bunch of before and after pictures of lips, because I love doing lips, too, but this has nothing to do with the slides necessarily. So, one two punch. The, I, I say this to my patients all the time that, hey, we're gonna do a one two punch. And what that means is sometimes when they come in for a treatment, it's not that they're there to give you $500 for you to do Botox. That's not how it works. You're there to solve their issue, whatever it is. If they don't like their 11s, sometimes men have very strong 11s. You can't get rid of them in one session. You need two or three sessions, or at least two sessions to get rid of it. So understand that, hey, we'll do it once today, come back in two weeks and we'll do another one. That's a one-two punch. Lips, first timers who come in for lips, you should always be underdosing. You should never be overdosing or just trying to use the whole syringe just because they bought the syringe. Who cares if they bought the syringe? Throw half of it away if you need to, but don't just inject it just because they bought it. That's absolute nonsense. What you should do is give them just a little finesse, especially if they're first-time patient, and have them come back and touch it up if you need. But first-time patients, you always want to do the one-two punch philosophy. And then the same thing with forehead fillers. You have an overactive forehead filler, or overactive frontalis with low brows. We were talking about this earlier in a couple of groups. And so what do you do? People who have really deep forehead lines, but they have low brows. Right? If you inject too much Botox, the brows will drop even lower. So that's where you have to think about, how do I do this? So the one-two punch there is to do some forehead filler to give them the support that they have lost so that they don't have that wrinkling, then do a little Botox, one-two punch. So you always have to think about the one-two punch when you're doing treatments. Anatomical limitation. This is one of the biggest things that will serve you so well if you just learn this and think about this. There is no reason every patient can have Kylie Jenner's lips. Just realize that, let them know that it's not always possible, okay? Instagram may show otherwise, you know, but the point is that not everyone can have everything. We have patients who come in and show us pictures of Rosie's lips, and they say, we want to have Rosie's lips. It's not possible. A girl who comes in with little tiny lips and wants big, strong Cupid's bow like this, it's not possible. Here, you see how we strengthen this Cupid bow. It's because she already had a strong Cupid's bow, so we're able to augment and make it look stronger. But you can't always do everything for a patient, and the, the more you understand that and are able to push patients away, the better off it'll be. Balancing X, remember your balancing X. Crow's feet and forehead wrinkles, for example. If you inject Botox in the crow's feet, the brow might go up. If you inject Botox in the forehead, the brow may go down. These two, in my head, are never to be done isolated. You should never be doing just forehead Botox on patients, even if they come in just saying, oh, I just want Botox on my forehead. That's not how it works. We tell them in our practice, I can't do that. In order to do forehead Botox, I have to balance it with a little Botox in your crow's feet, otherwise it will change the shape of your brow. Your brow will drop if I only do forehead Botox. They argue that they don't understand, and they get to a point where they understand that the artist is now telling them what I envision for their face, and they have to either agree or go somewhere else where they will just do the forehead Botox for $17 a unit or whatever it is. Other thing, matching upper and back, lower vector. She came in for lips, but what I told her, you can't just do lips because I think a little filler in your cheek will serve you well as well. So you always have to realize that people who have hollow temples, older ladies in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, hollow temples, and they want their cheeks done. You can't necessarily do that. If you give them higher cheeks with hollow temples, it'll look even deeper. So keep all the balancing acts in mind. Uh, we'll quickly go through this. Learn, learn, learn. Put aside your ego. <coughs> Talk to as many people as you can. Everyone thinks they're the best at what they do, and that's marketing, right? So put that aside. Just do as much as you can. Talk to as many people. Tell them your mistakes. Learn about their complications. Learn about their satisfaction. Learn what makes them better. But don't worry about the ego and the fact that they say, you must do this. Everyone says you must do something in their lectures. And it's scary, because you're like, oh, I don't do that, I must be doing it wrong. Ignore all of that. And individualize to your success comfort. Someone always knows more than you, and everyone has something that you don't know. So keep that in mind as you grow your practice. Don't feel intimidated by people. And always remember, low dose is safe. So a girl like this who comes in and wants a little filler in her lip, just do a little bit. And that's in our practice. We also don't charge per syringe for lips. We charge flat rate for lips. If we use more than one cc, we charge them again. But if we use a third of a syringe on their lips, they pay the full price for lips, as the same girl who used a full syringe. And that's just the concept that we're not treating you based on volume, because only I can diagnose how much volume you need. So keep that in mind. Low dose on first time patients is the way to go. Don't just use the whole syringe because they bought it and you feel like you owe it to them, okay? And then elegance is always in style, okay? And when in doubt, just stay elegant with your patients. If you're not sure of, oh my God, I don't know if I should do this Kylie Jenner lip thing on them, don't do it. Just do what you think is right. Stay with the elegant philosophy. It wins in the long run. There's
there's lots of gimmicks. You're gonna see these booths today. There's gonna be hundreds of booths that you're gonna see over the next weekend. And they're gonna sell you on every single device, tell you it's the best thing in the world, and it's amazing. And it didn't even exist six months ago, and it may not be here at the next conference. So keep that in mind. Don't fall prey to the gimmicks, and just be very set in your ways, but you have to figure out what your way is. Uh, four Seasons, Waldorf Astoria, this is my last slide. Keep these in mind, okay? Why do Waldorf and Four Seasons, why is their service so amazing? It's because they prioritize it. If you're prioritizing the injection in your practice, but nothing else, then just your injection will be good, okay? It's like the, those fancy beds at the Hyatt's or Marriott's, whatever it is. You know, th th it doesn't compare to having the, the Four Seasons or Waldorf quality. So think about all the little things, stress balls, out-of-band wafers, tiling needles, ice compressions, customization, some patients need more, some patients need less, follow-up calls and texts, showing <coughs> the patients when they come back their before photos to show it to them. Because sometimes they don't realize what you did for them, how amazing their Botox actually is. They'll come back saying, hey, I still have some movement, and they show them the before, and they're amazed. So take an <coughs> extra second. And then when in doubt, just massage, okay? That's my last pearl, just massage, massage, massage. You think you did too much, just massage. You think you did too little, just massage. Massaging helps, and it makes the patient at ease. Send them home, tell them go home and massage three times a day, 20 minutes, you know, or for three, uh, three times a day for the next six days, you know, just massage. Massage helps so many problems go away. You'll be amazed, they'll call you and say, I don't think my cheeks look good, they look uneven. Massage, just massage. And it's amazing what will happen. A week later, they won't call you anymore because it did fix it. So always massage, and that's it.